Okay, let's go and uh, just talk about things that are not usually talked about, which is how do you actually practically uh, go about setting up all of your algorithms. Um, and in particular, um, the way I see it now, which is not the way I saw it maybe a year ago, and maybe a year from now I will see it a little bit differently as well, but the way I see it now, the uh, framework and the, the protocol that you need to follow to develop even in an algorithm goes somewhat like this. So first, uh, you really uh, find out about all the uh, uh, all the capabilities of the trading platform that you're using and all the restrictions that it imposes. And you need to know them really well. Um, and uh, second of all, uh, just uh, the kind of backtesting tool is typically not enough. You also need to set up an optimization tool, which is actually in some form provided by the Quantiax platform and something called a cross-validation tool. Uh, and after that, only after that, you actually are, you are allowed to start uh, staring in the ceiling and coming up with strategies. So what would be the way I should try to trade on the stock market? And when you come up with a strategy, you need to uh, backtest them using these two tools. And then you can uh, compare them in a uh, reliable way, in a statistically significant uh, kind of uh, valid way, so that your results of your backtesting actually mean something. And uh, this is somewhat counterintuitive, especially when you first start in, uh, in, fi in doing machine learning for finance. And some of it is, is actually, some of it actually gets easier if you have done machine learning before, but there are a lot of important differences. So I hope that this talk will uh, allow you to kind of jump over some of these uh, moments where uh, other people will get stuck and so that this project won't take you too long. Um, so uh, before uh, we even start talking about uh, algorithmic trading, there is this very reasonable objection. Actually, quite a lot of economists that are like professors in the universities uh, publish papers and get Nobel prizes for ideas like stock prices fundamentally cannot be predicted. Uh, so what does it mean to say something like this? And what does it mean to argue with them and maybe prove them wrong? Um, well, there are many possible, <laughs> uh, there are many possible kind of science, scientific positions where that you can take and like scientific paradigms that you can use, but we are going to use this machine learning approach. Uh, so price prediction is essentially, uh, summarized by this sketch. So you had, uh, some kind of market performance like the change, the price that was changing from day to day. And uh, you need to find out what's gonna happen tomorrow. But it's not only that, actually, if this was only, uh, the only problem that we needed to solve, uh, our life ha ha would have been easy. Uh, but let's, uh, let's compare this kind of uh, problem to the things that are usually discussed in machine learning. So when somebody means, says machine learning, usually he means something like this. So you are given a task that is called image recognition. So you are, uh, need to answer a question, what's in the picture? And you are given like a set of possible answers. So it's like a multiple choice question. And it can be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, zero. And uh, then your pic the picture is given to you. It's just one of these kind of hand written digits. This is a classic kind of image recognition problem where you can train a neural network and it works. Uh, now, in this same setting, uh, price prediction, uh, kind of, you can think about price prediction as the following. 
uh, problem. So you're asked what's in the picture, but the picture is not there. So I have not shown you the picture yet. So essentially you're just given this and you need to predict before you actually see it. So the only uh, thing that you have access to is the other. So maybe I've already flipped other cards, but not the one that you're trying to predict. Um, and this analogy is actually quite good because uh, we are trying to predict what's gonna happen tomorrow and actually the best way to do it is just to wait and see. Uh, and uh, if we kind of could do that, then <laughs> like there, there's really no problem. Um, but uh, this thing that happens tomorrow, it, it happens tomorrow. So typically all these processes that uh, people are kind of colliding, like I want some trying to buy, some trying to sell, it's all going to unfold tomorrow. So oftentimes, uh, um, kind of these processes have not even started yet today. So it's, and the, the outcomes of this process are often random because there's a lot of randomness involved. Uh, so that's why there's this fundamentally inaccessible information in trying to predict stock price. And that even without like talking about the market being uh, efficient and uh, prices being impossible to predict because like if the market is efficient, then there's like a, a, a contradiction if prices can be predicted. So uh, this is even like before thinking about that, we already see that there is this huge problem. Okay. Um, so to make this a little bit more specific, uh, what we have to deal with in the actual data uh, is that uh, compared to the uh, digits, uh, recognizing digits, in finance, we get way more noise. So uh, imagine the digits that I said where most of the digits look like this. So you pro your neural network probably won't train very well on this kind of data set. And you can actually check it by hand. You can take a digits data set, you can introduce noise, and then you see how it starts performing more and more uh, poorly. Um, Okay, so, but that's not the only difference between finance and uh, uh, machine learning. There's also uh, this issue that price prediction by itself uh, is not something that, uh, that people want out of a hedge fund. So when you know the price after, or like when you have a prediction of the price in terms of some kind of expectation values, probabilities, then you need to decide what is that that you're gonna do? Like what are you gonna buy, what you're gonna sell? And uh, so what is the way to make money using the prediction? And if that is not enough, I mean like, so this is like an extra extra layer that you need to solve essentially. Uh, if that is not enough, there is also this danger. So if digit prediction is something that we as humans are neutral towards, right? So if you have an algorithm that randomly kind of just by luck predicts digits really well today but maybe not the data set that comes in like from some other person that had another handwriting uh, we, we won't get too excited about it we'll just wait we will probably be fair to this algorithm but with finance if we get an algorithm that makes a lot of money we immediately run around with it and show it to everyone and uh, try to convince rich people to give us more and more money. So people are really prone to this kind of gambling attitude and you need to actually discipline yourself to think straight when you are uh, uh, doing something on the stock market. And it's pretty hard to do that. Um, so Okay, I, I, I just said noise, but I didn't actually properly, uh, mathematically explain what I mean by this. So suppose we have some model for the process that's been going on. And in that model, uh, well, there are certain <coughs> correlations and indications, but also there's this huge contribution to the uh, change of the price that we are trying to predict that is just inaccessible to us completely. So 
nothing in the information available to us tells us anything about that contribution. So, and in the case of stock market, it's pretty much everything. So what other players are doing, we don't know. What other players are thinking, we don't know. And there are also unpredictable events that we just don't have any record of them in our data set, but they actually influenced what was happening, uh, like natural disasters and uh, things like that. And also some people can have insider information that is actually important, but we don't have it. Um, so all of that together uh, by something like uh, central limit theorem, uh, when it's added to our originally like fictional kind of theoretical ideal pure data, smears our data so our kind of digit becomes something like this or our kind of price become, goes completely the opposite way that we expect. Okay, so that was just to uh, kind of give you guys appreciation for that. It's actually quite a hard problem. It's probably harder than your typical machine learning problem because of this noise issue. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we still can have courage and try to challenge this problem. Uh, so, and in particular, you can do it by using this toolbox. So let's go uh, with the toolbox. Uh, this is the slide of code uh, that I wanted to show. It will be actually really important for your development on trading system of trading system, and probably when you play around with the toolbox, you already have done something like that. But it's really important to get your uh, data into your MATLAB environment so that these variables are accessible to you from the command line, so that you can run uh, plotting on them and. Uh, just investigate different relationships on them by hand, uh, not by running kind of not by running only the back tester itself. So and uh, the toolbox provides these two functions that are actually very useful. So you can get setting from one of the standard systems that is this the empty system that was provided to you, and then you can load data according to the settings, which is just kind of specifies the time intervals. Uh, and uh, the, the futures that you guys want to trade with. And after that, um, oh, so this, this is just probably some kind of error, I should have deleted it. But after that, you can access the, the numbers in, in the data uh, by just this kind of indexing. So data contains a variable close that has all the prices over the interval, all the close prices of futures of the interval of uh, the amount of years that you specified every day and uh, all the futures that you have. So in this particular case, I, uh, I access future number two. And I, I find the change of price where when it exists over the consecutive two days and I throw away the outliers and then I plot a histogram of this change of price and what you see is exactly like the central limit theorem that I was talking about. So you get some kind of Gaussian distribution, which is for our purpose pretty much all noise. So uh, the best prediction for this kind of random variable, it's very easy, it's just kind of this in the middle, right? <laughs> so we predict that nothing's going to change. The change of price is just zero. Uh, and one can check that this uh, prediction actually gives a better mean square deviation of the actual uh, price change uh, compared to like the, the simple algorithm that you can use like trend following or whatever. And that, that's quite amazing, I mean, but uh, it's actually really hard to come up with an algorithm that is better, like statistically significantly better than just this nothing's gonna change prediction. Um, if you look at mean square deviation, because mean square deviation is huge, so here it's like a, I don't know, $500. Uh, and uh, so a uh, typical algorithm that you will come up will have like a mean square deviation of order like 550, maybe 450 if you're lucky, but you can't really get lower than that. Uh, so that many people find discouraging because Okay, we have a good prediction, delta p equals zero. Uh, but we'd like to make money. If we know that 
price is gonna is not gonna change then we don't feel like buying or selling right we don't know what to do or we prefer not to do it uh, to do nothing right so uh what where where did we where was our problem right where did we made a mis made, uh, made a mi make a mistake yes, the mistake was in the choice of objective function so the traditional machine learning objective function for continuous variable is this mean square deviation but it's completely inappropriate for finance because we actually want to make profits so our objective function should be profits so something that prefers predicting like non-zero price move even at the cost of increasing mean square deviation so not 500 by 550 dollars uh, so we want to make profits and at the same time have bigger mean square deviation than the trivial prediction is that possible so this is your kind of math problem for you guys. I, I want you guys to, to have a vote. So suppose you have this kind of formal setting of the problem. So the profits are the sum for each stock and each day of the decision that we make times the change of price that followed in that day. And the decision is based on our prediction. Um, and then mean square deviation is just difference between the prediction and the, the true value. Uh, so if the prediction is zero, then uh, so that, that this is um, if the prediction is zero, then this is or sorry, if the prediction is just the, the today's price, then uh, the, the, it will be the actual true difference in price between today's price and tomorrow's price. So the, tri the, tri the mean square deviation of the trivial prediction is uh, just the, like, the mean square deviation of the, the picture that we observed, right? Now, uh, the mean square deviation of our more fancy prediction can be different. So because we actually predict non-zero value, uh, sorry, a value different from today's price here. So can it be that our mean square deviation is bigger, so we actually worse at prediction here, but we're still making positive profits? So what do you guys think? Is it possible? Who thinks that it is possible? Who thinks that it's not possible? <laughs> So we are worse than at predicting than this guy that says nothing's gonna happen, but we're still making money. <laughs> okay, so all of you guys abstained. <laughs> Anyways, well, Martin knows the answer, but anyway, <laughs> maybe because he's in the slides. Uh, so this is actually possible, and uh, there are plenty of examples. And the issue is actually because this decision vector was kind of like ill-defined. So, uh, even if we're restricted to being always plus one or minus one or zero, uh, then, um, so then actually these two things become pretty much independent because we can predict plus two, but our decision will still be plus one. And then the mean square deviation of our prediction will be huge. So the way, the way to read it is that, so one of the four things happens. Uh, the price goes down by $2, the price goes down by $1, the price goes up by $1, the price goes up by $2. And in every of these four cases, we predict correspondingly that price will go down by minus $1, price will go up by plus $2 and etc. right? So if you just count, like if you subtract minus two, minus one, you get one and then square it. Uh, if you subtract minus 2 and 2, you get minus 3 and square it, so you get 9. So you already got 10, and from this part you also get 10. So your total mean square deviation is 20, which is much bigger than your deviation of a uh, trivial prediction, which is just 2 squared plus 1 plus 1 plus <coughs> 2 squared, which is 4 plus 1 plus 1 plus 4, which is 10, right? However, if you use this kind of decision, right, then you... Uh, in, in the case where the price move is big, you make a right decision. In the case the price move is small, you make a wrong decision. But it doesn't matter because on average you are making every day 
uh, 50 cents of profit. So, and actually, even, even if you get rid of this kind of issue, even if you make all your predictions be the same absolute value, you can still kind of get that. Uh, so, it's not like a mathematical obstacle at all. You can be really bad at prediction in terms of mean square deviation, but still be making money. So, if you get a mean square deviation that is 550 for your really good model, you shouldn't be discouraged by it. it this model can still actually make money. Um, okay. So, but what was this issue about uh, whether we need to have decision that's just plus or minus one? Or can we have decision that is let's buy 10 or let's buy 100 futures? Um, so, First of all, let's address this question from purely mathematical point of view. What if our decision, this variable that we, let's think that we don't know anything about what it means, we just think about it as a purely mathematical optimization problem. What if we could take it plus minus 10 in the same example that we considered before? Um, well, so it means that in, in finance terms, it means that we somehow even though we didn't have money for it, but we still managed to buy or short 10 times more. So maybe we used some kind of leverage or whatever. Uh, then we get our expectation value, that is our 50 cents, get multiplied by this factor 10, so we get, make $5 in expectation value. Of course, it doesn't take into account that if we leverage something that we can have a margin call and we can lose all our, our money, but uh, so, we get rid of the finance component, we just try to set up a mathematical problem that is correct. And we see that at the moment this mathematical problem has a problem. So, if we just multiply our decision by a constant number, then any positive expectation value gets bloated to, to infinity. So, it's hard to optimize something where by something really e so hard to optimize profits, because you can make them infinite, right? So, if we just do this, it would lead to infinite profits uh, after, after our optimization procedure, if we try to optimize this decision. And that does make sense. We want to set up mathematical problems correctly. Our mathematical problem, optimization problem correctly. So, this maximizing of sum of profits over all days on all futures leads to infinities unless we bound the decision. Say it's just plus minus one. However, there is another way where we don't have to bound the decision and that other way actually ends up being more uh, fruitful. So instead of bounding the decision and here, we can bound, get rid of the infinities by normalizing the subjective function. So instead of maximizing our profits, we can maximize uh, the profits over the mean square deviation of a profits roughly. So, it's a square root of sum of squares of the, the profits that we're making every day and at every, in every market. Um, and modulo some unimportant technical details, it, this quantity is actually just equivalent like, to sharp ratio. So, if we choose to get rid of the infinities in this way, which is mathematically more elegant, then we just get a sharp ratio. And uh, now our mathematical problem can have like arbitrary big decision vectors and uh, it's still perfectly correct. Uh, so that is some kind of mathematical motivation for introducing sharp ratio. Uh, and uh, it, so now we have a well-defined optimization problem, just maximize the sharp ratio. And uh, luckily, in this Quantiax toolbox, this is sharp ratio is actually something that is used to judge the competition. And let me, uh, of course, they, they or you guys included it not for this reason that I showed you. It's actually an important financial indicator. Uh, let me explain to you guys how I think about sharp ratio. Uh, so, Let's say your sharp ratio is 0.5. Um, so for every stock market, uh, for every investment, you can draw this kind of curves where it's your predicted returns. 
uh, and uh, plus minus one sigma deviation from it. And this is time, and this is your total money. So the interesting question is when this plus minus one sigma actually gets out of the negatives. So this, this time in years uh, is uh, essentially one uh, over sharp ratio squared. So in this particular case, it will be four years. So after four years, you can guarantee to people that your algorithm will make positive returns if it has sharp ratio 0.5. And in the same sense, so since Quantiax have this three-month testing period, which is uh, 0.25 over a year, right? So this 0.25 should be equal to 1 over sharp ratio squared. So uh, I think sharp ratio equal to 2 is enough if, if your algorithm actually actually has the sharp ratio equal to 2, like this is the true value, then uh, somebody who does not know it uh, will be perfectly convinced in it after just three months. However, I mean, it's actually not that easy because your algorithm can have actual true value much less and still give this performance over three months, so it doesn't actually mean anything. But this is still a good kind of uh, hand wave it, or like the good, good kind of back of the envelope way to think about sharp ratio. Okay. Um, so this is our first conclusion. So this is our actual optimization problem that we are trying to solve is maximize the sharp ratio. Um, and it's a very well defined optimization problem. So uh, we are in a good shape so far. Uh, now we talked about this decision vector. And in Quantiax, the decision vector is uh, actually a little bit uh, different. So because every day we need to, or like we, there's an extra complication, yeah? Every day we need to uh, think what to do with each one of our 40 something markets. Um, so what is this P that is being assigned after at the end of every algorithm? Um, you probably already kind of, oh, <laughs> is this recording? Oh. Yeah, so you probably already figured out some kind of way of thinking about it for yourself, but let me give you my definition, the way I think about it, right? So P, this vector for this particular day is, is such a vector that the absolute value of its case element is a fraction of our net worth, total money, uh, that we decide to use, to buy or short, depending on the sign, this uh, futures number k. So if you like to think about shares, then p is the number of shares uh, of the futures that we decide to own for that day, uh, times the price of each share, e e and like negative price if we're shorting it, uh, and uh, divided by the total money that we have at that day. Uh, also modular some like unimportant technical dif technical complications. And uh, in uh, these technical complications, you guys can familiarize yourself with them if you actually try to read the run TS uh, script that's provided in the toolbox. So in particular, this script uses this red function and also uh, uh, it's at some point it sums uh, it all up. So people who tried to ask me about toolbox before, they had a lot of issues with the sum over here. Because if red is the relative returns of each kind of futures, how, how can we sum the relative returns? We should sum the absolute returns, right? But actually, because they're all normalized by the total money, so we actually summing the absolute returns when we do this sum. So it's all kind of written correctly in the run TS. Uh, so total money, what I call the total money, is actually called fund equity in uh, the Quantiax toolbox. There is also a variable called equity, but it has no direct meaning actually uh, for what, what's going on when our algorithm is trading. It has the indirect meaning. 
so if you guys are interested, I can tell you what it is, but it, only if you actually <laughs> like care. Uh, so because it never gets used anywhere. Um, so you can plot it and look at it, um, but it's not getting used for actually evaluating your algorithm. Um, so this is actually one other issue that I found counterintuitive because I don't come from finance background, I come from theoretical physics background. So when I get words like fund equity, I just don't know what they mean at all. Because like if I go to Investopedia, there is like a definition for fund and definition for equity. And if you try to put them together, like it can mean anything in the world. And uh, many people use it for completely different things. However, when you say total money, then it's pretty much clear what it is, right? <laughs> but for some reason, finance people decide not to. Um, and that's kind of, a, I mean, the more you work in the field, the more you become like that. I mean, it's not anybody's fault. Um, so another thing that they do with this decision vector uh, is that since it's a fraction, uh, they need to normalize it and they do it automatically. So you can put any arbitrary big decision vector there and it's automatically normalized by the sum of absolute values. Um, so since it can be arbitrary big, then you can think about it as this thing that we call decision in the previous uh, portion of the talk. So our, if we solve our wonderful optimization problem, which we need to learn how to solve actually, probably independently of backtesting because, well, backtesting provides a way to, to run it, to get sharp ratio and to optimize it. Uh, but it's kind of slow, so you probably want to, to, to make it faster if you actually want to optimize. Uh, so at least now, like, the problem is perfectly uh, well set up. So we have a, uh, an equation for the, the change in the total money every day and we have the equation uh, for sharp ratio and uh, we need to optimize the sharp ratio and this decision can be anything you want, roughly. Um, now, how to make a decision, right? Uh, this is something that is supposedly like a basics of the basics of any time series analysis, but it's still good to say it one more time, right? So any time series can be broken down into more traditional kind of machine learning uh, setup where you have the target, what you're trying to predict, and the list of features, and you have a bunch of observations. And it's done by the simplest duplication, right? So you take some amount of prices, so in toolbox it's like 500 days, and then you just uh, take the, the change of price over here and you take this whole uh, thing as a, as a row in your table. So the gray thing will be uh, uh, features and uh, the yellow thing will be the target. And then you do it for each and every day so you have a lot of uh, redundancy in these gray uh, rows but then you just kind of forget that they, they were coming from the same thing, you just kind of collapse it all in the table. And then you have this huge set of features and you need to decide how to look at these features and then, make, then maybe extract like important features out of it. So uh, your decision is actually a decision that's being made based on this uh, original kind of raw features that you have. And that's just by definition like what what's what, what is that that you're writing for a toolbox written in this symbolic form? So uh, you need to make a decision that, and uh, then your profits will be multiplying this decision by the delta p and uh, you, all these formulas from the previous slides apply. Um, okay. Um, so actually Toolbox even provides you a few uh, already made functions to do this decision. And symbolically you can write them like this. So there is a function that's called mean reversion, there is a function that's called trend following. So you can introduce an extra parameter here in this decision uh, vector. 
that would be just the, na the name of your algorithm. So it's like zero or, and, or one. And depending on the name of the algorithm, you will apply the corresponding uh, function from the toolbox to this set of features. In fact, each one of these algorithms, if you look closely at it, has two parameters. So it has like the long period at which to look at and the short period at which to look at. So uh, in fact, you have more parameters that you can add and then you have uh, this whole set of decision functions that are indexed by this combination of parameters. So you can think of having a parameter space where your uh, algorithms or your predictions live and for each point in this space, you can actually go and calculate sharp ratio. Uh, so you can just call them parameters. And then you can add your own algorithms to this space as well and their parameters. So for the algorithms that we considered, it will be this 0, 1, which algorithm to use, and then two, two periods. OK, so uh, it's not the end of the story, though, because we have multiple futures to trade. So we don't have to trade them all with the same algorithm. Instead, we can use different algorithm on each one of them and then combine uh, the decisions that we made for each one, each one of them. Uh, but it's easy to say combine, but it's hard to actually do it because uh, if you see the original, the original algorithms, they just decide to say plus minus one for every single futures. And that means that all the futures that they decide to trade that day, they just split the portfolio equally between them. And uh, they shorten long with this amount of money that is like an equal share for each one of them. But, uh, well, it's definitely not the best way to do it. In fact, quite a huge portion of the whole kind of investment and finance research literature and books written about it is written exactly about this problem. How do you uh, optimize your portfolio? How do you decide which portion of your portfolio to hold in this and which portion of your portfolio to hold in that? So uh, it's definitely not the best way of doing it, right? Uh, however, I mean, nobody knows what is the best way and how to make decisions. You need to uh, somehow represent your confidence in each futures and each prediction that you have by a weight that you assign, so the portion of your portfolio that you actually use to trade. it. So the total decision vector will be some kind of, some combination of our decision vectors for individual futures using some kind of method that assigns weights based on confidence. So if you see, if you think about it like in a relatively relaxed general way, then this method over here is just one more parameter. So now our set of parameters actually is which algorithm uh, two periods for each single futures and then the method to combine them all. So we have much bigger space of parameters. Uh, so every futures now can be traded with its own parameters. And, uh, okay, so we have this space of parameters. What uh, do we do with it? How do we actually uh, proceed? Well, we already have set up our optimization problem mathematically precise, so we're maximizing the sharp ratio that is uh, given by the formula, like the product of decision times change of price divided by uh, the same thing, but the, 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 mean, the mean square derivation of it. Uh, so we just need to solve this optimization problem now. So we can, we just need to find at which parameters the sharp ratio is the biggest, right? So, and actually this parameter space is not very big. So if we make steps like five or 10 days in our periods and uh, if we just randomly choose like a few uh, or, uh, sorry, if, if we just find out some way to choose the best uh, algorithm for each particular futures, then we can run this optimization, actually run it. Uh, maybe we will need to do some parallel processing for it, but it, it can be done. And uh, you can find just the best combination. Oh, sorry. 
the best combination of all of these parameters that gives the biggest sharp ratio on the back test. Um, and I did that. So I actually, the first competition that I participated, I did exactly that. So I tried to do this maximization and I lost because right after the algorithm was submitted, uh, it was doing pretty well, but then pretty badly. And eventually you see that it actually just stays the same level. So there was no relevant information in, in this kind of optimum that I found, this maximum that I found at all. Um, it's been a while ago, so it's been already nine months. So if it had sharp ratio at least, uh, at least one, then I would have seen it by now. But since I don't see it, well, it probably doesn't have sharp ratio one. Um, so, however, back then I actually, I didn't do only that. I actually knew that I don't have like 100% chance to win because I did a little bit more and I knew that this algorithm actually doesn't have sharp ratio one. In fact, uh, the name that I give to one of these algorithms is sharp ratio point one. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew it anyways um, and how did I know it so there is this important generalization that uh, you need to do uh, is that this algorithm this decision uh, vector can be written as dependent on parameters and hyperparameters so the distinction between parameters and hyperparameters is completely artificial at this point uh, in fact, you just have your parameters and then you split them into two pieces the way it's more convenient to you. Um, and depending on how you split it, you will possibly get different results. Uh, however, we need to make this distinction. And uh, after that, uh, actually, finally, we can do some machine learning. So machine learning, as, as much as I understand it, actually starts when you split the data into training set and test set. And you run your optimization twice. So first you run kind of on the training set, the, sim the same kind of simple-minded optimization that you already did. So you maximize your, what you call parameters, uh, and maximize your sharp ratio with respect to them. But hyperparameters, you just uh, pick a few, you just hold them fixed, right? And then this optimization is a subroutine now. So now you need to, circle through your hyperparameters uh, and just for every fixed value of hyperparameters you need to run this whole optimization thing but then you need to uh, compare the sharp ratios on the test set so the parameters you find on the training set but you use them on a test set and uh, the best performance on the test set tells you which what choice of <coughs> hyperparameters to pick so in that sense, your choice of hyperparameters is protected in a way from uh, just like this, this kind of thing that, that happened before. So uh, if, if, it, if you choose something that it's probably either, uh, so it, it, you can see when, when this, this value, the maximum that you achieve here is big, then you can convince yourself that you have chosen something that is actually there. So this, hyperparameters that you found actually capture some kind of dependencies that are in the data. Okay, and this whole kind of procedure, especially when I wrote it in, in words, may seem confusing. And I don't mean to like give you uh, a kind of clear explanation of what's going on here. It was confusing to me for quite a while, but I actually find this page on Wikipedia really helpful. Uh, it's called Tuning Hyperparameters, and it it's written in a quite clear way, and it just goes through what I was trying to explain in one slide. Good. So uh, this is the way that we can know in advance whether our algorithm or like the hyperparameters that we choose actually capture something about, uh, or like the and the parameters that we choose actually capture something about the real thing. Um, now. I, I just wanted to give you an example of how, how does it look when it's all set up and done. So here I had two hyperparameters and uh, I just for each pair of them, I just calculated the sharp ratio on test 
using the parameters optimized on training. And this is the, land, the kind of landscape that I get. So the negative, the, the, the blue ones is just kind of the C where uh, everything loses money. But these yellow things are actually algorithms that, that still kind of make money even on the data that they have not seen before in terms of parameters, right? So actually like they have not seen it before at all. It's just that I randomly chose these two hyperparameters and it actually makes money on the test set. Um, so, and then, well, you do the obvious thing. You choose the hyperparameters that make money and uh, you optimize the parameters for them and you get your algorithm that is kind of provably uh, good. So um, that's it for my talk. I just want to say that I did not have time to cover other important topics that also lead to a lot of confusion. So in particular Quantiax toolbox, you have to deal with slippage that is uh, and this kind of uh, a loss that you assume every time you trade something, um, this 5% loss. Uh, so you don't want to trade too often. And because of this slippage, uh, any kind of algorithm that trades relatively often possesses this counterintuitive property. So you have an algorithm, you have its decision vector for every day, and you just uh, you, you just kind of uh, negate it in a sense that you say, now let's try to trade with minus decision vector. And if your algorithm was losing money, it, it will still be losing money. It's just because even though you inverted the bear kind of returns, since you trade very often and your bear returns are small, you always pay negative on the slippage. So both of your algorithms, even if you do exactly the opposite, will still lose money unless you actually win a lot of money in, uh, on, in your bear returns. So. Um, Now, and actually this inspires my answer to all these economists who claim that uh, predicting stock prices has fundamental difficulties. I mean, in that particular formulation, there is no problem at all predicting stock prices. Uh, but you, you predict this kind of movements, then you try to trade on them. And uh, you just need to pay a lot of fees or lose a lot on slippage. And in the end, you just don't make money. But you can check that you predicted what's happening. It's just that you predicted very rapid movements and like, what do you do with it? Um, okay. Now, uh, another topic that I have not covered is, well, I just wanted to say that um, at first when people get into this, they think that if it's about money, then somehow it's about a lot of money. But it's not actually the case. So if you uh, are trying to do it on your own with your own money, that's, then it's like very little. And uh, if uh, you're trying to attract, uh, if you're trying to do it as a business, as a hedge fund, then you need to attract really a lot of money because what you get is a cut of a cut. <laughs> So it's not actually the place where you need to get greedy. Um, okay, but it still has some relevance to your personal financial decision because financial decisions because this framework of machine learning it can kind of be applied to uh, trying to get confidence or like see how much how much confidence will, do we have in this or that particular financial decision. However, there is an issue because our kind of personal financial decisions are typically not of the uh, of the type where we buy and sell something every five days or every 10 days. It's the kind of buy and hold decision that lasts over five, two to 10 years. And uh, for that, we just don't have enough data because this kind of cross-validation idea, the, the hyperparameters idea, it doesn't really capture the fact that every eight years there is a recession or something or like small kind of market collapse um, very well. So, and also it doesn't capture the fact that the economy can just stop growing in the future for some reasons that have not been present before. 
but for buy and hold strategies, it is very important, of course. Um, okay, so and finally, uh, if you get a really good strategy, you all everybody tells you why don't you go to a hedge fund and then you need you, you start learning how do these hedge funds work and uh, sometimes you decide to actually do it sometimes you don't um, so I, I I guess it's also interesting to, to to see from my point of view what what did I encounter when I started thinking about this um, okay. Thank you.